I just, I really feel that God's got something special for you guys in this room tonight. I really do. I think he's got a word for you. How many of y'all believe that tonight? Amen. How many of y'all thankful for the blood of Jesus tonight? Amen. Tell you what, if you haven't already, find about two or three people and just give them a handshake and tell them you're glad that they're here tonight. Can we do that? believe he's in this room tonight. How many of you want to experience him tonight? Amen. Let's do that tonight. Exactly. Let's exactly do that tonight. Can we lift our hands to heaven tonight? We love you in this room tonight, Jesus. Come on, begin to cry out today. Lift up your hunger tonight. grace in this place tonight. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You would lay down your lives. Then I would be. Sing for all you've done for me. Lift your hands all over this place tonight. Come on, he's worthy in this place tonight. Let's see that. Who brings our chaos back into order?
your grace, Jesus. your prayer tonight. I want more tonight, Jesus. Sing this out tonight from your heart. Worthy is the Lord who was slain. Worthy is the King who will conquer the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who will conquer the grave. tonight. You got something to praise about tonight. It's amazing grace. It's his unfailing love that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would more and more tonight.
just take our time tonight and just worship him. Is that all right? This is your time too.
Praise Him tonight. Hallelujah. He is worthy of all of our praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Turn to your neighbor right there beside him. You tell him you're going to be better for being here tonight. coming to service tonight, and we want you to give joyfully, cheerfully tonight. It's a good thing to give praise unto the Lord, amen? But it is a good thing to give praise to the Lord, amen? And so as we give tonight in our worship, it does not just, it is not just a song, it is not just a message, but it is our giving of our time, our talent, and our treasures that blesses the Lord. And so as you do so tonight, know that you are being a blessing but God also will find you and bless you as well. Amen. Father, thank you for this time together tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for worship. Thank you for my brothers and sisters to my right and to my left. I pray that bless them indeed tonight. Bless them in their uprising, their downsetting, their coming in and their going out. I pray that everything their hands touch causes it to prosper and be blessed. And Father, if you'll bless them, I'll thank you like you bless me. I give you praise for it tonight in Jesus' name, and amen, amen. Worship the Lord in your giving tonight. Let's uh, go to the word of the Lord tonight. Thanks, uh, Pastor Matt, for uh, filling in last Wednesday for me. And then uh, Brother uh, Pastor Sparks filled in for us on Sunday. And I just heard that I had a tremendous time in both services. Amen. 
And, uh, you know, that's an, that's an honor for a pastor to be able to go away and know that the congregation is going to be well taken care of. Amen. It's a blessing and be an honor. And uh, I pastored for many years and didn't have that luxury, didn't have anyone to uh, back up or fill in or anything like that. And it is an honor to have such gifts in this house, right? Amen. They're not backups or aren't secondary. They ha carry the same anointing in this house that I do. Amen. Because they're under this covering. Praise God. And so it's just the flow of the Spirit is the same. If I'm here or not, we're not building this church on me. We're not building it upon my personality. If we are, uh, God help us all, right? Amen. But thank God we are here tonight because of Jesus, right? Amen. And so it doesn't matter who's preaching or who's singing. We're here for Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Three of you are. We'll find out before the night's over who the rest of you is here for. All right. Praise God. Well, I'm, I'm excited about this month of June. Now, I know a lot of people go on vacation and a lot of folks do a lot of different things. And uh, that's all well and good. And, uh, but you ought not take the whole summer off right you know, maybe a week or so here and there but don't take the whole summer off if you miss the month of june here at the tabernacle you're going to be missing an impartation one of the uh series that i uh, am most excited about uh being able to share with you i've been praying about this for quite some time and uh, during our uh series on our church rocks. We're going to be talking about all of the things that God has helped us to accomplish by his grace in this past year. We're going to talk about the salvations, baptisms, lives being changed, ministry that are going on. A lot of times we only know about what goes on on Sunday morning here, but this ministry is reaching around this region. There's things going on each and every week, and lives are being impacted and changed, right? And uh, so we're going to talk about that, but I'm going to be talking about something that uh, the Lord, have you ever had the Lord just put something in you and you didn't know why you believed it, you just knew you did? Uh, there's something that, you know, and, and then as you walk with the Lord, uh, you begin to get revelation and understanding that it is true, not only in your spirit, but it according to the word of God and uh and those who have been here with us for the past four years, on June the 7th, I'll be pastor here for seven years, or seven years, four years on the 7th, right? And, uh, and I, if you recall and remember during that time uh, when we even very first began here, I put, pushed on you about generations. And uh, there is something about the generational blessing. There's something about... Uh, when generations will come together that you can receive from God something when multiple generations come together that one generation just cannot get and uh, so and I've often wondered how it was and why it was that generations fought with one another so much why is it that one generation cannot receive uh, what God has done in another generation. Why is it that that one generation will fight another generation's worship? Y'all quiet tonight. Why is it that we we that war is going on? Well, the war is going on because the enemy knows that if the the fulfillment of God's word is going to come to pass generations must come together amen generations must come together and I want to talk and start tonight in this uh, Wednesday night just to talk to you about finding the flow of generational blessing finding the flow of generational blessing and then over the next few weeks I'm going to unfold this for you and, and show you how that God is a generational God and he blesses from generation to generation. How many know when they address God in the Old Testament, they didn't just address him the God of Abraham. How did they address him? They addressed him the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
Amen. Do you know there's some things that God promised Abraham that didn't come to pass till Jacob? Uh, I'm not going to preach that tonight, uh, but I will before it's over. Amen. In, in 1 Kings chapter uh, 17, let's go start there and we'll work this thing through here just a little bit tonight. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, and uh, this is talking about the servant Elijah, right? And it's in the midst of a drought. And it said, and it happened after a while that the brook dried up. How many has ever had the brook dry up? Amen. If you haven't, hang on, baby, it's coming. Amen. The brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Amen. God will sometimes dry up your brook so you'll move from where you are. He'll allow the brook to dry up so he can get you to where he needs you to be. Amen. That which is sustaining you, he will allow on purpose to dry up so he can get you to go to the destination or the place of blessing that he has because God is always flowing. He is always moving. And that's the reason I've said finding our flow of generational blessing because you've got to find that flow. It said, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he calls to her and says, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink right he's asking her for the most precious commodity of the day he's not just asking her simply for a cup of water but he's asking her for something that she has has to have the foreknowledge that there is a drought coming and so therefore I must hold water back are you with me and so she in the midst of a drought in the midst of a famine still has a resource of flow, has a flow of water in which that she can tap into and bring the man of God water. And so she had to have known that. She had to have a spiritual perception that drought is coming and I must prepare for it. You see, this is, uh, well, let me not get ahead of myself. Let's read on. And so he, she arose and went to Zarephath and said, please bring me a drink of water, a cup, and she said, uh, was, as she was going to get it, he called her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. I mean, no, he's pushing on her now. Amen. She didn't have no problem going and getting the water, but now he's asking her for a cake, some bread, and, and it, it brings the ugly out of her. Amen. In verse 12, so she said, as the Lord God liveth, I don't have a bread, only a handful of a flour in the bin and a little oil in the jar. And see, I am gathering a cup, couple of sticks. Now, how many know she ain't planning on cooking much? She's gathering up two sticks that I may go and, in and prepare for myself and my son that we may eat and die. Amen. This is a limited mindset here. How many know you can be free in one area and not be free in another? And she has spiritual perception to know that a drought is coming, so she is able to retain or hold back, prepare for the drought, that while in the midst of famine, she has water to spare. But watch this. Now she comes and she says, this limited mindset, this is all I've got left. How I many know it's easy to give away a piece of pizza when you got a whole pizza? But how I many know nobody's offering the last piece? Come on. Amen. And, and she says, this is all I have left. But this is what we have to understand is there's a twofold blessing here. Number one, this woman thought that it was for him. When in the reality is this this. Uh, what he was asking for was not for him, but it was for her. 
because this is a sign of a, a spiritual uh, sign of sowing seed. It's called seed faith. And there's a lot of people that will give out of their abundance, but there's few people that still know how to give out of their own lack. But you see, that is a seed that is being sown whenever we don't have enough, we don't have an abundance, we don't have spare, we don't have extra, but what we do have, we need it. But yet the word of the Lord comes and says, bake me a cake first. Amen. And now she is taught a spiritual principle that is going to catapult her into her future of having a blessing that goes beyond herself that goes beyond her generation because she is about to sow a seed into the kingdom of God that is going to be an investment in the next generation. Watch this. Here she is and she says, all I've got is this little handful of meal and, and, and her mindset is, I've got to keep hold of it. This, we're going to eat this and then we're going to die. And the man of God speaks to her and tells her, if you'll bake me a cake first, woman, right? If you'll put me first, if you'll bake me a cake first, he said, the flow will never stop in your house. The meal will keep on flowing. The oil will keep on flowing. But you've got to put me first. You've got to sow a seed of faith into this thing. And if you will do that, he said, it'll never run dry. Glory to God. You see, now whenever we look at this, he tells her this. And then Elijah says to her, do not fear and go and do as I said to you. Make me a small cake first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For well, thus saith God of Israel, the bin of flour will not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain in the earth. Right? And so the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah spoke. Praise God. And so had she not done that, Okay, are you walking with me? Had she not done that, she would have not been prepared for what was about to take place in verse 17. And now it happened after these days that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. He's dead. Right? So she says to Elijah, what have you, I had to do with you, man of God? You have come to me and bring me uh, my sin in remembrance to kill my son. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Then he carried out or cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy to this widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. And the Lord heard his voice, Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him, and he was revived. And Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper room into the house, gave him to his mother, and Elijah said, See, your son lives. Hallelujah. See, your son lives. Now watch this. Had she not sown a seed of faith in her time of need, she would have never received a harvest. Because if you don't sow, you cannot reap. Come on, somebody. If you don't put any seed in the ground now, you can't expect any tomatoes in July. If you don't sow any seed in the ground now, you cannot expect to harvest when you need it. 
That's the reason why that we have to, every generation has to sow seed because the seed that was being sown was not just for her, but this young boy represents another generation. This another generation was dead, was lifeless, had no hope. Come on. And yet because of her seed of faith that she had sown in time of need, Amen. God began to, when it came time for her to need a miracle, God was there to respond to her need. Hallelujah. And see, let me tell you something. Watch this. This, this, when Elijah came, Elijah came and the Bible said that he took and he stretched himself out over this other generation. He stretched himself out over a generation that was lifeless. He stretched himself out over a generation that was hopeless. He stretched himself out of, over a generation that had no life and was dead and was not breathing. And I want to tell you, but whenever a generation can never come to its full potential, it can never have hope, it can never have life, it can never have the strength that God has ordained for it until it comes up under another generation of authority. But when it comes up under the generation of authority, it will rise up and it will live, and it will fulfill its purpose in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Now, the problem is, let me just say this, the problem is that we're raising up a generation that don't want to come up under authority. I have to say that because I'm pastor. Amen. And unless we come up under authority, we can never have authority. Unless we come up under authority and we begin to live, it's only going to happen whenever we submit ourselves and we line up with that authority that is over our lives. And so if we want full, the fullness of God, if we want to live, if we want to have life, if we want to have the strength and the purpose of God fulfilled, then we have to come up under authority and then and only then will we live. Amen. And so he speaks about another generation. She sows, and then this generation that she sows to live must come up under the authority of another generation, and when it does, it begins to live. Now in verse 18, or chapter 18, excuse me. And it came to pass after the Lord came to Elijah, in the third year, saying, Go, present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. How many understand he is, there is a flow here. There is a constant flow. He said, I'm sending you oil that won't run dry. The meal barrel will never go empty. He's telling him, I sent you to a, a brook. And when the brook dried up, God gave him instructions to go to a widow woman that had water. Now he comes and he tells him here that I'm going to send you to Ahab and tell Ahab it's going to rain on the earth. Now here's the second seed faith. So Elijah sent, well, went into the pr uh, presence of, pr to present himself to Ahab and there was a severe famine in Samaria and Ahab called Obadiah who was in charge of his house and now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly for so it was while Jezebel uh, massacred the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hid them 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water He's in the middle of a famine, and he hides a hundred prophets, puts 50 in this cave, 50 in this cave, and through all of this time of famine, he is feeding them bread and water. There is no water. But yet Obadiah has water to feed and water a hundred of God's prophets. Verse 4, for so it was while Jezebel massacred 
uh, the prophets of the Lord, he fed these uh, hundred prophets. Verse 5, Ahab said to Obadiah, go into the land to all the, the springs of water and to all the brooks, perhaps they may find grass and keep the horses and the mules alive. And so they went. And Obadiah, verse 7, and now as Obadiah was on his way, suddenly Elijah met him and he recognized him and he fell on his face and he said, is that you, my Lord Elijah? And he answered him, it is I. Go tell your master Elijah is here. Now, uh, the story, we won't read it all, but what Obadiah is confused about is he says, you want me to get killed? You want to get me killed, aren't you? He said, because I know what you're going to do. He said, I'm going to go tell uh, Ahab that you're here. Then God's spirit's going to pick you up and take you over there. And I ain't going to know where you're at, right? And, and I know what Ahab has done. He sent out all these people. He said he searched all the world trying to find you. And when they come out and tell him that you're not there, he kills them. He said, now you're trying to get me killed, right? And then in verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. How many know that the altar has been broken in our land? We have a prayerless nation, and, uh, and really we have a prayerless church that has produced a prayerless nation, if we want to be real about it. And, and so... Elijah said, the first thing I've got to do is repair the altars that have been broken down. And then Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of tribes, but number 12 is the number of authority, right? And so he takes those 12 tribes also, and, and, and the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall uh, be your name. And then the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and made a trench around the altar enough to hold uh, two uh, sheaves of seed and he put the wood in order now watch this because if there is no order there is no blessing I said if there is no order there is no blessing and and we've got uh, you know a lot of folks today that don't like a place of order but God only blesses where there is order I said, God only blesses where there is order. If there is order, if you'll take time for order, God will bless it. Amen. He put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood, and said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and the wood. Amen. Here he's calling for the most precious commodity of the day and says we're not going to give God something that, that is just uh, that is uh, in abundance. We're not going to give God something secondary. We're going to give him the most precious commodity of the day. I want you to go get some water. Amen. In the midst of drought and pour it on the sacrifice. Amen. And so we see that that's what took place. And then in verse 36, and it came to pass at the time of offering that the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things that your things at your word. Amen. He prays to the God that is the God of generations. We set up in the first of this service, but he didn't just pray to the God of Abraham, but he prayed to the God that had been faithful to the God of Abraham, to the God of Isaac, and to the God of Israel or the God of Jacob. And so he is speaking to the God that has been faithful not to just one generation, not to just two generations, but multiple generations. God has revealed himself as faithful unto them. Hallelujah. 
And so he prays to him knowing that the God that has delivered multiple generations is going to hear his prayer and answer him. Why was he so uh, uh, full of faith that God would answer him? Number one, he put the thing in order, right? And so if you, if you see that God isn't blessing in your life, if he's not blessing in your relationships, if he's not blessing in the church, the first thing you've got to look at, is it in order? If it's out of order, then God has nothing to bless. And so it has to be in order. And then second of all, he brings God not a cut rate, not a second best, but he brings him the most precious sought after commodity of the time of famine, which is water. And he said, God, I'm giving you my very best. This is the best that I can bring to you. And then he prays to the God of a g multiple generations that he knows will not fail him. And he said, let it be known this day that the God of Israel, that I've done everything that I've done according to your word. And then, say then. Then what? Then after it's in order. Then after he brings him a sacrifice. I mean, no, we, we, ain't, we aren't up on sacrifice. We don't. People, you can't even get people to tithe regularly, let alone bring a sacrifice. Amen? It got quiet there. Maybe I need to talk on that a minute. Amen? You can't even get people to be faithful in that. You let alone bring a sacrifice. People come to church when it's convenient, but don't ask them to sacrifice. Amen. The church has run the evangelists out of a job because you can't get them to come. Don't dare ask them to come on a Monday night. Huh? Don't dare ask them to come for a whole week of church. But then, after the sacrifice, after putting things in order, he prays to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the fire of the Lord consumed the burnt sacrifice. Hallelujah. The wood, the stone, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trenches. I mean, no, that was getting hot. That wasn't just a little poop. That was a blazing fire that consumed the sacrifice, that consumed the order, that consumed the wood, that would speak to another generation and say, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob is still with you now. He is still answering prayers now. He is still moving now. And if you will just put your life in order, if you will make a sacrifice to him and call upon his name, get yourself in alignment of the authority that is over you, he said, I will answer you then. I'll answer you then. And now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. Isn't it amazing some people won't believe until they see? That's the reason why this generation, I tell you, that this generation will be won by signs and wonders. Amen. Because they will not believe unless they see. But when they see blind eyes open, when they see the, the, the lame leaping for joy, when they see, those who are in bondage and sickness and disease and infirmity that doctors cannot cure. But in whenever we pray to the generational God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he answers by power, people are going to know that he is alive. People are going to know that he is the only true and living God. Hallelujah. 
And I'm telling you today that I'm thankful for my heritage. I'm thankful for my grandmother and grandfather. I'm thankful for my parents. I'm thankful that I have a, 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 a heritage that is very full and very powerful. But I want you to know that I'm not just satisfied with that. I'm going to pray to the God of my grandfather and the God of my father that is my God and I'm going to speak blessing into the next generation. Amen. And that they will not die. That they will not be destroyed. But they will rise up and they will live and they will fulfill their full potential. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. How many know, and I, I, you'll hear this again, but how many know that that boy fell dead at the time of harvest? He was some 15, 16 years old, right? He's at, at, age, at the age now that he is going into the harvest. He is about to do, oh, hallelujah. He is about to do something himself. Amen. And at the time that he's about to step into ministry, at the time that he is about to reap his own harvest, the sun is at the brightest and he falls dead. That's the way the enemy is always wanting to work. He wants to attack our gener these generations when they're a we have sown into them. We have labored. We've spoken over them. We spoke blessing over them. We've encouraged them in the word. And about the time that they're ready to step out, how many people, how many generations do we leave, lose when they go to college? Come on. How many do we lose when they turn 15, 16, 18 years old, when they're ready to step in the harvest field for themselves? Amen. But I want to tell you that whenever Elijah showed up, he said, uh-uh, you might have done it before, but you're not going to do it to this generation. This generation is going to rise, it's going to live, and it's going to fulfill its purpose. I say to the tabernacle, we've got a mandate from God to stretch out over this generation next generation and say drugs are not going to take them down. Alcohol is not going to take them down. Perversion is not going to steal their harvest but we're going to speak blessing and life over them and they will live and they will reap a harvest. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trenches. Hallelujah. And verse 41, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain. The sound is not in the natural, the sound is in the spirit. For Ahab did not hear the sound. I said Ahab did not hear the sound. Elijah had to tell him, I hear a sound. It is because Ahab was not connected to the generational blessing. You've heard of a generational curse? But I'm going to tell you the generational blessing is greater than the generational curse. Amen. And Elijah was connected to a source that was not just in his generation, but he had roots in the generation of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that now come into his generation. And he was hearing something in the spirit that those who were not in covenant could not hear. And he told Abraham, he said, go and eat, do what you're going to do. But he said, I hear a sound of an abundance of rain. Hallelujah. I tell you tonight, church, prophetically, that I hear the sound of a rain. I hear a sound of an end of harvest that is coming. I hear the sound that is getting louder and louder and closer and closer. That there is about to be a shift in the spirit. And there is going to be a generation arise up and say, we didn't get here by ourselves but we've been connected to the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob we're connected to the God of our forefathers we're connected to the God of our father and we are standing here now bringing the generations together and we say we will reap the harvest that God has ordained for us oh I wish somebody would give him praise tonight
Hallelujah. What time is it? I don't have my watch. That's the bad thing about not having notes. Then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink. There is a sound of an abundance of rain. So Ahab went up and ate and drank, and Elijah went to the top of the Carmel. Then he bowed down on his ground and put his face to the knees. And the servant, uh, he said, go out and look, see. What do you see? He said, there's nothing. I mean, know sometimes you can hear something before you can see it. Amen. Especially in maturity, in leadership, in the church, you hear it before you see it. And so you have to, even though the things around you tell you it's not happening, you got to have enough faith in what you heard until you see it. Hallelujah. He said, go and look. He said, there's nothing. And he said, go and look again. There's nothing. He said, go and look again the seventh time. And he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up and to say to Ahab, prepare the chariot and go down before the rain stops you. And now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black, the clouds and the wind, and there was a heavy rain. And Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, girded him up his loins, and ran ahead to the entrance of Jezreel. Hallelujah. All through the time of famine, there was a flow of water to those who were in covenant with God. Amen? Until from the time God said it's not going to rain till the time there an abundance of rain came, in between that time span, God provided for those who were in covenant with him. There was a brook, there was a widow, there was a, a source that came for the wood, sac the water sacrifice, and then there was a sound of an abundance of rain, and then the rain came. We could go on, and we will go on later on. But let's go ahead and finish this right here out, chapter 19. Is that okay? What time is it, Brother John? There you go. I like that answer. Chapter 19, and Ahab told uh, Jezebel all that Elijah had done and now had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Elijah sent a messenger to Elijah saying, uh, you know, as God lives, he said, I'm going to uh, take your life from you by this time tomorrow and all of this. And then we see how he goes into this place of depression, right? And uh, this anointing is so obvious upon his life that he, his assignment in life is to take out Jezebel, the spirit. Not just a woman, but the spirit. But he goes into depression. This is what I want to say to you tonight. Before you come into the fulfillment of your assignment, even though that God will sustain you, you have to be careful because there will come a spiritual attack in your life that will try to stop you from fulfilling what God has ordained for you. But just know that God's source is enough. I said, God's source is enough, and he will sustain you. Now, he, he, watch this, because it ends this whole story. Of, if you're not careful, we can end up like Elijah, because Elijah, God provided for him all this time, but yet he goes into this place of a spiritual battle and warfare, and he begins to give in to the spirit 
that begins to attack him, right? And he comes to this conclusion that I'm the only one left. Now, let me just say this for him. Can I say something? I'm not, I don't know that he was complaining and saying I'm the only one left as much as he was saying I don't have no one else to speak into. I don't have nobody to pour into. I don't have anybody that wants to listen to what I have to say. I don't have anybody that's standing with me in covenant, right? He doesn't, he doesn't see that. And so God speaks to him and he says that you're not the only one. I've got others, but you're just not connected to them. How many know there's more than just us here tonight? We, we may not see them, we may not know them, but there's more than us that wants to see the move of God. There's more than us that wants to see the, the, this generation uh, empowered by the power of God. We may not know them. We may feel as though we're the only one. We may feel as though we're isolated. But I promise you tonight that God has a world that is full of people that wants to see the manifest presence of God in the earth. Amen. And so he, he looks and he says, I'm the only one. And he says, why don't you take my life? And he gets in a bad place. Have you ever been in a bad place and you couldn't hear God's voice? He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, he passed in a great strong wind. Was in the, uh, tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind afterward, an earthquake, and the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it that he appeared, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave, and suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And I make this submission to you, and you can do what you want to with it. But I believe God was in the wind. I believe God was in the fire. But I believe God was in the earthquake. But Elijah was not in a position to hear it. He had to come out of the cave. And when he came out of the cave, he didn't need a fire. He didn't need a wind. He didn't need an earthquake. God could speak to him. You've got to position yourself so you can hear the voice of God. And if you're not careful, you'll be driven into a cave. And you feel as though that you're isolated and you're the only one left. And you're fighting this thing by yourself. But be sure that before you give up, that you position yourself where you can hear the voice of God. He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord host because of the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant torn down the altars killed the prophets with a sword and I alone am left and, this, and they seek my life too and I believe this is one of the saddest scriptures in the Bible then the Lord said to him go return on your way in the wilderness to Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimsha, as king over Israel, and Elijah, the son of Saphath of Abel, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Let me just close by saying this tonight. When he was walking and understood that he was in a, uh, in a bl place of generational blessing, there was nothing he could not conquer and nothing he could not do. He faced 350 prophets of Baal, had a showdown, standing there by himself, just him, God, the Holy Spirit, 
and said, started laughing at him. He didn't just call him out, right? He said, cry a little louder. About noon, he said, cry a little louder. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's gone on a far journey. He, he can't hear you. Cry a little louder. And he's taunting them. And then he prays this little prayer as he gets the wood in order. He brings a sacrifice of water and he prays to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God answers him by a fire that is so hot that it licks up the water that is in the trenches. And he's laughing. When he understood that he was in covenant, nothing could stop him. But when he felt he was by himself, he was no longer connected to the generation of God. Are you with me? He didn't say, I'm here with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I'm here all by myself. And when he was standing there all by himself, he felt overwhelmed. I want to tell you, there is power in knowing a gener multi-generational God there is a blessing that rolls from generation to generation. And you may not have the privilege of being able to be grown, raised up in the church, but there is spiritual sons and daughters. There are spiritual mothers and fathers. There are spiritual grandmothers and fathers, right? To where the generational blessing can come upon our lives and we don't have to feel like we're standing alone by ourselves but we've got generations backing us up. We've got the promise of God's Word over our life. And together we will win. I said together we will win. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may wonder, well, Pastor, why are you so passionate about this? I'll tell you why I'm so passionate about this. Because they have taken surveys and they say, that the generation that Pastor Eric is now ministering to so adequately every week that only 4% of them will be Christians in America. 4%. I don't have a voice in this nation. I don't have a platform to speak around the world, so as to say, but I have a platform in this region. And by the grace of God, I said, by the grace of God, we'll defy the odds. We'll defy what other people have said. And this generation will raise up a strong and a mighty army of people that believe in God and know that God is real. Amen? Amen? I'm not just going to sit by on my watch. I said, I'm not going to sit by on my watch and watch another generation be bound. Amen. I didn't think I'd get much help, but I thought I'd get more than that. I mean, no, we've lost a generation already. Can we be honest? Can we be real? This church is blessed. Let me just brag on this church a little bit. This church is blessed. We've got the largest, one of the largest senior ministries in this whole state. We have the largest young adult group. We, out of the, our, our size church, and a couple of years ago, y'all went to the, that thing they had down there in, in what was it, Tennessee? And, and they, the leader of that told me we had the second largest group of young adults attending that. Amen. If you don't believe it, just go visit some churches. And anywhere from 20 to 40 will be absent in the church, age group. From 20 to 40, there'll be void. They'll not be there. That generation don't know the God of their fathers. And the enemy fought so hard and I'm, I'm, I know I'm talking tonight, but you'll hear it over the next weeks. But the generation, the enemy fought that generation so hard. And the church did not understand the importance of generational blessing until instead of wrapping our arms of love around them, we've pushed them out. That.
some church up in here on Sunday and uh, we're going to just release some more of this promise of God. This will just kind of whet your appetite and let you know where we're going and it's going to be awesome before we get through June. We're going to see God bless us and do greater things in our future than we have in our past and we're going to celebrate those things we've already accomplished but we're going to believe God for greater things. Can you believe God for greater things with me? Amen. So we're believing God for that. And uh, let me just say to you that a couple of announcements real quick. On um, June the 6th at um, Giovanni's in Milton, they're going to be doing um, 10% of the sales that day. We'll be get, they're going to donate to the church here for missions. Okay? And so go eat at Giovanni's and buy something to take with you. All of that good stuff. Buy your order your food for the week down there, and uh, whatever it takes. And just uh, they're going to bring give ten percent of that to missions. That's going to be great. And then also we're we're going to be taking. Uh, we have announced a yard sale uh, for uh, sometime in June, but uh, we've made an executive decision this week, and we're not going to be having that yard sale. But what we're going to do is bring those clothes in. We're going to send them to Oklahoma. All right? And uh, so, yeah. And so, don't bring any junk, but bring some good clothes. Go by Walmart, get a box, put them in there, make it look good, put some faith word in there, speak blessing to them. And then uh, at the end of the month here, close to the end of the month, we're going to send that to Oklahoma. And if you would like to go to Oklahoma and be a blessing there, uh, you let me know, and we'll make sure that you get along on that trip. It'll be about a six, seven-day trip, all right? Okay, and then we're going to Honduras in October, so we're not going to just sit around. We're building a church in South Africa. I've got pictures today. The walls are three-quarters up, and it is beautiful. It isn't just old block, but it's it's brick, man. It's, it's going to be the sharpest church in that area. And uh, we're a part of that, praise God. Not only that, but we are a part of building the kingdom right here in this valley, right? Amen. And so, yes, yes. So we are fulfilling the vision of being, reaching out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the fourth uh, places, the uttermost parts of the earth. God is helping us to fulfill our vision and dream. Amen. I love you guys. I appreciate it because without you, none of this would be possible. Know that we never take that for granted or do not do we not understand that. But because you're a part of the vision, we are able to see this come to pass. So thank you so much. If you don't have any clothes, you'd like to make a donation, we'll give opportunity for that on Sunday morning, okay, for Oklahoma. All right? Is that good? All right. God bless you. I love you. Y'all have a great night, okay?